Hi friends, uh, I'm Pia Lee and uh, I run a very vibrant agile community named uh, Discuss Agile Network where we try to provide a platform to the agile and scrum practitioners and professionals from across the globe so uh, they can connect and learn from each other and in this process we keep doing various events, conferences, workshops and webinars as well and today we have a very special guest with us we have uh, Thomas friend today with us Thomas is a business agility consultant and uh, he is from North Carolina area today uh, Thomas will be speaking about a very interesting topic the business case for agility let's see what uh, Thomas has to share with us Thomas, over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. I guess it would be good afternoon. Um, I am uh, talking to you today from uh, Charlotte, or excuse me, from uh, Florida um, with my wife at the beach uh, uh, for our 25th uh, wedding anniversary. Well, thank you for the introduction uh, again to Today we're going to be talking about the business case for agility, specifically in the financial sector. Uh, a little bit about me, uh, I have been in the XP uh, Scrum world uh, for a, a long uh, time, uh, have uh, 12 years uh, experience in Agile Scrum, uh, 15 years in IT App Dev, uh, and uh, about 25 years uh, in the military. Uh, I was both a Navy pilot and a uh, Air Force pilot. And excuse my um, uh, controls for WebEx, it was not uh, uh, minimizing for me. Hopefully this will work better. Uh, can you let me know if that works better? Yeah, it's, it's good to go now. All right, thank you. Well, let's start out by level setting uh, terms. Really, what is agility? Well, agility in its context is the ability to be quick, light, to have ease of movement, to be very nimble. It's to be able to respond to change, to quickly reprioritize the use of your resources, and to be able to react to emergent changes or threats. So think about this in business. It's maximizing business value with the right size, just enough, just in time, process and documentation being iterative and incremental. Well, where did this whole Agile thing come from? Well, it came from a bunch of fellows that got together back in 2001 out at Snowboard, uh, Utah, a skiing resort. Uh, they were dealing with the convergence of Moore's Law, processing power, object-oriented programming, and they needed to understand what method, what process they could apply to reduce complexity. What they came to understand was no one process would meet everyone's need. But what they did come to understand that they were uncovering better ways of developing software and by helping others do it. And within this, they came to value the following things. Individuals and interactions over processes and tools. Working software over comprehensive documentation. Customer collaboration over contract negotiation. And responding to change over following a plan. They said, well, there's value in the stuff on the right, they value what's on the left more because it allowed them to be more nimble, more agile, and react to the needs of the customer. In my current uh, client, I can tell you, uh, in their past, their documentation was absolutely amazing. I've never seen such thorough documentation. But the reality of it is it added no value because the customer would never uh, receive that or see it, but it was in the contract and they followed the plan. But regrettably, that was lost money. So let's talk about it. Individuals and interactions over processes and tools. When you look at processes and tooling, where we keep requirements, how we do our documentation, how we track bugs, it is the conversation with an individual about acceptance criteria and the definition of done 
that truly defines what the customer wants, not what's being captured in writing and held in a repository. Working software is the measure of success in, in agility. Uh, you can have all the documentation in the world, as I was saying earlier, but if it's not working, if the customer doesn't see it, business value is not delivered. Customer collaboration over contract negotiation. I'm sure many of us on the phone today have been on projects where we have delivered what was in the contract, but the customer, well, it didn't meet their expectations because we didn't engage them along the way to adjust. Because you can't define everything successfully up front without having those in-depth conversations in context. And finally, responding to change over following a plan. With very large software development projects, one of the things I've noted is that the requirements change over years uh, many of these larger projects uh, take. So by the time you're actually able to deliver a set of requirements in a waterfall approach, the market has changed and the market has moved on. Agile is an ecosystem. There are many frameworks and methods underneath it, but imagine it as an umbrella. So Agile, a parent of many children of many different dimensions. Those different dimensions are used in different ways throughout an organization. In this graph, you look at the XP at a daily or individual um, uh, level. You have XP, your test-driven development, behavior-driven development, groups working together on a daily level. Uh, as you move to the team and a project level, you see Scrum, that's over a period of weeks, Lean Software Development, Agile. Finally, at a program level, departmental, you see Kanban emerge. Uh, your mature DevOps, your scrum of scrums, being able to bring uh, components and dimensions of more complexity uh, together. Your XP scrum and Kanban uh, are all focused on delivering value. At an enterprise level, consider that Lean, Plan, Do, Check, Act, Kaizen, A3, all are focused at reducing waste. It's an interesting thing. Both have the same outcome in being able to give value, but at the enterprise level, the focus is on reduction of waste, whereas on the delivery, it's focused on delivering value. Now, I'm not going to go into all these, but I just want to throw this up here. There are many frameworks and practices. This graph, I crowdsourced on LinkedIn, looking at the technical to social and team to organizational visual various frameworks and practices. You can see that frameworks are used from a perspective of scaling and being able to broaden it out across an organization. Your practice are those things that allow you to engage at an engineering level. Then let's look at some statistics, setting the foundations. The number of organizations that practice Agile in 2014 was 94. And I know these are a little bit older numbers, but the numbers are still relevant. The reasons for adopting Agile? Accelerated product delivery and enhancing the ability to manage changing priorities. In doing this, there is an increase in productivity and it enhances software quality. Agile methods in practice, well, guess what? Scrum is by far the most predominant Agile framework that's used there. Uh, the emergent uh, behind Scrum now is going to be a scaled Agile framework. It just came out in the latest uh, version one report. So let's touch on Scrum before we delve deeper. Uh, deeper into the uh, uh, why Agile from a financial perspective. Scrum is very simple. It's very simple, it's easy to learn, but difficult to master. On the left-hand side of this, you have the iteration backlog, your requirements. From that iteration backlog, a team will take 
items and bring it into sprint planning. Task them and then work on them for one month or a time box of one month or less. Every 24 hours, they're going to coordinate what they're doing and at the end of that time box, have a potentially shippable product increment. Very elegant, very simple, uh, but very powerful. Within that framework, there is the focus of the backlog. You know, when you look at the Standish report, uh, Standish said that there, when you look at any software package, only 7% of the functionality is always used. Now, I'm sure everyone uses Word or Excel. Uh, let's take Word, for example. Within Microsoft Word, the top 10 functions of Microsoft Word comprise 34% of the functionality used. It's paste, copy, spell check, uh, bold, underline, and change font. When you look at the other items, for example, except changes, something that would be sometimes used, once you get to past the top 50 items, you touched on 90% of what's actually going to be used. So as Jeff Sutherland says, with this graph, 36% of the functionality in your big designs are really going to be used by your user base. Everything else is seldom or never, 64%. So if you were approaching a project and said 64% pennies of every dollar that I'm going to spend aren't going to be value to the customer. Well, that's not a good business proposition. So when focusing on what's always used, often used, and sometimes used, you optimize business value, you mitigate risk, and you have maximum transparency in your backlog based on value. It's very different than waterfall where you have your analysis, design, code, test, and deploy, and you deploy everything. 30 to 40 percent of system projects fail uh, prior to completion, and half of all system projects overrun their budgets by over 200 percent. That's crazy. And again, 64 percent of features are never or seldom according to the Standish report. You know, when Winston Royce wrote uh, Management of Large Software System Development in 1970, right after the picture of uh, Waterfall, he said that he believes in this concept, but it invites risk and failure. The problems with Waterfall? Well, you have fixed schedule and your Gantt chart effect. It requires uh, dates up front. It locks in unknowns and it sets unrealistic expectations. The fit scope is big design up front. Changes are going to cost more and it limits the ability to respond to change because you're following a plan. Having a fixed budget means high capital allocation up front. It locks in waste into the plan because you've already accepted that, well, you need everything, not the top 36%, as we were talking about earlier. Reporting and monitoring, duns are on activity, not on value. So you can be delivering all that no value item and that activity is making progress. Focus is on status, not on the customer. And in Incentives are tied to the plan, not the outcome or the value to the customer. Agile flips this uh, 180 out. So in Waterfall, your requirements are fixed, and what's estimated are your resources and your time. Within Agile, your product features are fixed, and your, excuse me, your resources are fixed, your buying capacity, and your time. Your product features are what is negotiable. Getting value sooner. When you look at um, agility, waterfall, well, why is the graph take so long to get value? Well, because you're delivering everything at the end. With agile, you deliver incrementally along the way. Ultimately, you get to a point where, hey, what do we get if we cancel here? You have what you need, and you can move on and shift into your focus into other things. When you look at the long 
time frame uh, with waterfall, you can have projects of 12 to 36 months. You define, code, test, deploy, and you have a myriad of deliverables of documentation. Contrast this to Agile, where you can have time to market much quicker. Your life cycle is defined code test, and you have potentially shippable product increments along the way. This ensures you focus on value and remove waste. Let's consider waste. If you have an 18-month pro uh, project, and remember 45% of, of software features are never used, on the far right, you have your value and you have your waste. Well, if you take away all that waste, at 10 months in that 18-month project, you're going to be delivering what the client, what the customer would want. Agile also reduces risk. I don't know if anyone uh, this morning uh, or this afternoon, excuse me, sales, but when you and you go from point A to point B, you don't take one, one big tack and then adjust. You take little zigzags to get there. In do, doing that, your little zigzags ensure that you don't have a lot of risk. In Waterfall, you amass a huge amount of risk before the software is delivered, and you look at what the customer wants. In Agile, you have tested working software delivered in short increments. Ultimately, that big, deep risk is minimized, as on the picture on the right. Project management versus Agile is very different. The scope the customer needs and wants in Waterfall is this big requirement spec and requires sign-off. In Agile, you have a story and you have a conversation and it requires customer involvement throughout the project. In Waterfall, your schedule is very detailed and fixed. In Agile, it is the flow of the delivery of the capacity of the team and the conversation around what can be delivered. The quality in a Waterfall project uh, is based on testing and acceptance at the end of the project. With Agile, testing and acceptance is built in in each sprint or iteration. Cost in Waterfall, a detail designed up front are estimates and rework reduces uh, uh, bug potential. Uh, in Agile, uh, the backlog and shorter time set cycles uh, eliminate waste, therefore reduce cost. Risk well, in Waterfall, Agile risks are intrinsically addressed. Agile communication. In Waterfall, you have a heavy change control process, checklists, sign-offs, uh, emails, and documentation. In Agile, it's about customer collaboration. You have iteration, demos, reviews that gather feedback, and retrospectives that let the team get it better. In Waterfall, Documents detail all the, ad, uh, all the dimensions of a project. In Agile, cross-functional teams are involved in conversations around all aspects of a project. This drives transparency. With waterfall status reports and documentation are what shares status. In Agile, the use of information radiators and information sharing mediums allow a transparency that you just don't have in Waterfall. The whole focus of teams uh, in Waterfall um, ultimately uh, result in big pushes at the end of a project. In Agile, there's a sustainable pace, uh, which is one of the core principles. Uh, in Waterfall, uh, having fulfilling, <laughs> fulfilling work can be very uh, difficult because you don't necessarily know what you're working with. In Agile, the team is given a problem to solve and work together to define a solution. In Waterfall, direction or being directive is very important. Management is by committee. Uh, managers accept input from team members, where in Agile teams, Participatory decision-making, reviews and retrospectives inherently invite people to be involved.
It is all the team, and that's what it comes down to, and that's what Scrum is about. Scrum and agility is based on the foundations of high-performing teams, and teams deliver products iteratively and incrementally, maximizing opportunities for feedback. Increments of a done product ensure potentially useful versions of products are always available. Well, how do you start if you don't have a high-performing team? Well, the Bruce Tuckman, uh, Dr. Bruce Tuckman established uh, the storming, forming, norming, performing, or the Tuckman model back in 1965. It really talks about how a team comes together and gets into that high-performing mode. It's all about coming together as a team and learning about each other as you storm and work together, uh, focusing the team. As a team has come and stormed and come together, they start to have norm and they start to act like a team. They look at their roles and how they can help each other evolve. And at that point, teams are able to express opinions. Ultimately, when a team is performing, the team members can work together towards a goal, self-organize, and be flexible to help uh, one another. In that point, the leader's role is blurred, and everyone is focused on outcome. But when you go through the Tuckman model, note that effectiveness of the team declines as they storm uh, form, storm, norm, and ultimately perform. Uh, in the storming, uh, there can be friction. The focus is to get through that for, uh, storming phase as quickly as possible into norms. One of the ways you can do that is with working agreements and setting down the context of what you're going to be doing. Uh, how we resolve uh, disagreements, how we have our meetings, uh, what uh, we use as our information radiators. All those things together uh, get you into a norming understanding very quickly. It's funny when you look at a team working together. I'm going to tell you a quick story about uh, a, a long time ago uh, when I was uh, trying for a seat on the U.S. Olympic rowing team. I had a coach, and I would tell my coach that I could I could lead the team better than anyone because I was stronger, I was faster, and I could outperform anyone on the team individually. Well, one day my coach said, well, fine, Tom, we're going to put you in stroke, and you can lead the team. Well, I was overjoyed. I got into stroke, and I started the race, and I raced my race, which was faster and stronger than anyone else in the boat. And ultimately, within 100 meters, the boat fell apart because no one could keep up with the pace that I would set. Ultimately, we ended dead last. And as I came in, the coach was very uh, silent. Several days later, he sat down and said, Tom, what did you learn? I said, well, sir, what I learned is my role on this team is in the middle of the boat, pulling the oar harder and deeper than anyone else. And that's how I help the team. And that's how we can, as a team, succeed. And he said, that's right. That's your role on the team. And that was a profound thing uh, for a prideful, arrogant young uh, man uh, to, to realize that it's not about you. It's about the team. So when you have cadence and you have flow, you have agility. And agility squeezes cash out of work in progress because it's all about the money. And value is delivered every few weeks. Risk is driven down. And you reduce that uh, waste by continually or prioritizing your backlog and your value. And this cascades up into increased project and portfolio returns. And the focus is on value, and value is dollars, and business is all about dollars. But you have to do this in an enterprise. And in an enterprise, to get that type of return, it all starts out at a grassroots level, moves up to get managerial success. So you have some pilots. Uh, you work up to awareness. Once you have management awareness, you can have teams grow. At a point where you have that team, that foundation, you can have executive sponsorship and then transform what's working in the context of your enterprise uh, across the entire organization. It's funny. 
many people think that Agile is just for software. Well, it's really not. In this picture, you see two aircraft. The one on the left is the JAS-35, and the one on the right is the, um, the uh, Gripen uh, fighter or European fighter. The waterfall program of the uh, F-35 is $143 billion over budget. Uh, it's not going to be able to be operational until 2022. The, um, the cost per unit is a third of a billion dollars. In Europe, uh, Saab, the Gripen, uh, is built using Scrum. The cumulative program cost is $15 billion. You can buy one of these for $43 million and they will deliver them to you. It's 20% of an F-35. What's amazing is this trend, um, this also reflects in the cost of operation. The Gripen costs $4,700 a flight hour to operate. The JS or the um, the F thirty five thirty one thousand dollars a flight hour. This can be traced back to the waterfall big design up front. It's amazing in the uh, the Saab Scrum teams building a fighter aircraft. They have test pilots on the uh, scrum teams. At 8.30 in the morning, the teams have their meeting or their scrum coordination meeting. By 10.30, the C-suite has had their coordination meeting and any impediments found at the lower levels have been escalated to the higher levels. Now let's translate this all into business value within the financial sector. We've talked about business value and why of Agile, but let's look at it now from a perspective of a real world uh, financial impact. Here are the brands of some of the biggest banks in the world. Why are they embracing Agile? Well, here is a picture of all the financial technology startup funds. Right now, this is a little old, but they're, they're over 300 companies that are going after financial technology services um, from a venture perspective. There's billions and billions of dollars that are chasing this. It can be on the lending side, the personal finance, payments, uh, remittances, uh, retail investments. But this specialization creates efficiency, and that specialization is frightening to the big banks. FinTech is an economic industry composed of companies that use technology to make financial services more efficient. Software as a service. They're generally startups, but they're founded with a purpose of disrupting incumbent financial services systems, banks, um, and corporations that rely less on software. So who are, who are they chasing? Well, J.P. Morgan, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. They're looking at going after them. Consider Google, Amazon, Apple, Apple Pay, FinTech are turning the market upside down. Right now, when you look at the banks, they have low return on asset. They have to jump across the chasm where the high return on asset uh, companies in their market space are Google Wallet, Amazon Payments, PayPal, um, Apple Pay. If they don't, there will be like Nokia, Sun, GM, Blockbuster, Kodak, who didn't make the, trans uh, the transition and have no return on assets right now because they're out of business. How striking is this? Well, consider this. Amazon, Google, Alibaba, Tencent have a return on assets in the teens, 20, 15 to 20 percent. The big banks are less than a percent. That is staggering. If the banks want to fend off the threat from fintech, it will require rapid innovation because they're just not that efficient. And agility is the key to that within their market. Well, how are they going to do that? Well, right now, they're looking at multi-level planning long-range planning over a year, saying this is who we are, this is where we are, this is where we need to get. From that vision of seeing where they need to go, they construct a roadmap. And within that roadmap, 
app are able to create release plans around products. Those products uh, and those release plans then can be executed on by teams uh, within sprints and your daily execution. That's going to be your short range, uh, what most of us are familiar with. But in order to do this successfully, there needs to be the automated release pipeline. So in this picture you see at the bottom your plan code, build, test, release, deploy, operate flow that you would see traditionally within waterfall. This is a fundamental uh, flow. When you look at setting the foundations of good code, where you have a single trunk, gated commits, your teams are using test-driven development, behavior-driven development, are doing good unit tests that then can have integration and automated testing. Well, you're creating continuous integration and good code discipline. With that foundation, you can create continuous delivery auto-deploy to your higher testing environments, auto-acceptance uh, testing at higher stages. Once that is built, continuous deployment or auto-deploy and promote to production is, um, is possible, uh, though very few uh, of the clients that I work with ever get there, just because of the, uh, the, the fidelity of testing in higher stages. When you look at this together, you have your continuous integration and your continuous delivery. They span the plan, code, build, test, release, deploy, and operate um, chain uh, across the software development lifecycle. This is the handoff or the, the courtship of enterprise agility and what we call as DevOps, uh, where operations and application development work together in that continuous feedback uh, of application development uh, with a good uh, discipline of uh, continuous integration, continuous uh, delivery, and auto-deploy. But to get there, the DevOps maturity model takes a great deal of time. On the lower left-hand corner, you'll look at uh, agile development, that transformation, setting a prop pilot, creating a team. These are development efforts at a lowest level, and you're creating that foundation. But once you have that engineering foundation set, you can move to a higher level uh, of continuous integration, uh, that DevOps phase one. As you have those project efforts and your DevOps phase one, then you can move into a product effort, multiple projects coming together, delivering uh, continuously to a higher, uh, a higher level. That's your DevOps phase two. Ultimately, your services efforts at the DevOps level phase three is your automated deployment. Hard to get to, but requires rigor and discipline in setting the foundations of your lower levels. This ultimately leads you to where we are today in the marketplace. Uh, back in 2001, when we started talking about the Agile Manifesto, Agile teams, what it was all about. You were creating that foundation, uh, that DevOps phase one. Then, uh, moving to a product, DevOps Phase 2, you were getting Agile at scale. Uh, that was your enterprise uh, and your lean and Agile software development. Ultimately, uh, your scaled Agile framework uh, led to a bigger, larger uh, set of teams that could engage in an Agile method. Now, the movement of Agility and business agility isn't in the focus of the teams that build the software, it's the teams that integrate the, th the software together. Consider open source, uh, platform as a service, infrastructure as a service, software as a service. The fintech uh, companies that are creating those microservices, as a, uh, as a company, you don't have to build those services, you just have to use them. So business agility is the ability to react, bring in all of those other services, all the other open source together in a agile, iterative, uh, 
mindset focused on the values and the, the principles to be able to meet business needs rapidly uh, and to be able to move stuff uh, to your customer to get value faster than anyone in the marketplace. So, well, here we are. How do I choose between Agile or Waterfall? Well, you have to answer some questions. Do you have a defined set of requirements? And are those requirements likely to change? I mean, if they're not, well, then Waterfall can be a good solution. Uh, can the customer accept long, uh, a long development process without getting anything? Have you done this type of project before? And if you have, and it's clear and it's simple, well, Waterfall might work very well. If you haven't, and it, there's a great deal of uncertainty, and you're, uh, there's a great deal of ambiguity, well, you might want to start with a very small bite of the elephant and work iterative and incrementally to get there. You have to look at which approach will ensure the maximum value to the customer, because in the end, it's the value to the customer that defines success in the business. Which approach will provide the best communication? Well, that's dependent on your context. What will empower your teams to deliver their best work? Because it's the best work that comes back to the customer. And finally, you have to consider what's working well for you now. A good set of questions to start from, but in the end, it's the business value. And that's what we're talking about today. Why Agile and the business value of agility? Well, at this point, I'd like to uh, open it up uh, to questions uh, to anyone on the, uh, the uh, conference. Uh, can anyone hear me? Uh, yeah, we have uh, some questions, Thomas. Uh, just let me oh. you know, let me assign this to you. Uh, Rajeshi okay. is asking, can you give some guidelines where Agile can be implemented? Uh, Agile may not be applicable in all types of projects, typically in projects where everything is known. All right. Um, Agile isn't always a panacea. Mm -hmm. I work for a very large uh, uh, company uh, that does utility work. But when we go out and we uh, put uh, lighting poles in the ground, you dig a hole, you put the pole in it, and you we have 22 million of those. We use waterfall and Gantt charts to put poles into the ground. On the other hand, uh, when you look at um, agility and agile, here's a very interesting uh, way that we are applying agile outside of software for development uh, with utilities. We're using Agile to do legal cases um, and having feedback with our regulators. So we're using little bits of conversations or value uh, for our regulators and delivering that iteratively and incrementally. There are many the other um, uh, uh, examples of Agile in manufacturing uh, and in um, outside of software, but uh, it's all the ties back to the values uh, and the mindset uh, that allow you to focus on value to the customer and uh, little incremental delivery. Does that answer the question? I don't know if I got that pr properly. Are there any other questions? Hello? You may be on mute. Yeah, uh, there are a few more questions. Uh, just let me read out them. All right. Okay, next and I'm uh, not able to see them on mine, so I apologize. Yeah, no. Uh, uh, Yobraj is asking, uh, when an organization going towards Agile, as a service provider to client, do we have to provide the coaching on the Agile methodology? Or is it something responsibility of individual organization? Um, what I have experienced in the uh, in my past is that uh, the it's always good to level set 
the um, experience of uh, agility. So everyone has a common knowledge. Uh, typically, those negotiations are in the contract that you have of support. Uh, even if I personally, I don't uh, uh, have that in my contract, I give lunch and learns, I teach people, just so you have, have a common vocabulary and understanding of the process that you're going to be able to use. That uh, alleviates confusion. Anyone else? Uh, next question is uh, from Manoj. He is asking, uh, can we use agile process in bug fixing or in QA process for any product? Absolutely. Uh, within agile, uh, if you look at um, bugs, uh, bugs are inherently um, uh, taken care of uh, within Agile uh, because it is an iterative and incremental uh, flow. Uh, when you look at a waterfall uh, project, you can also prioritize bugs in a backlog and work them through a scrum process. So yes to both. But hopefully, if you're developing software with an Agile Scrum process, you have very few bugs. <laughs> Another question, or yeah. are there other questions? Yeah, Vikas is asking, uh, we are in pharma industry, which is highly regulated, means uh, lots of documentation. So uh, what is best approach to work in Agile? We work, but somehow we adopt hybrid approach. Yes. Um, with what I've experienced in a highly regulated environment, and I've worked in uh, energy, uh, defense, and uh, 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 and uh, finance, uh, is that the documentation can be part of the definition of done uh, within your stories and within your deliveries. Uh, they, um, there is required documentation. Agile is not no documentation. It is minimum uh, viable documentation. I'll tell a very quick uh, story. Uh, in my current present reality where I work, uh, we were doing a uh, waterfall approach. The documentation that de developers were using was very thick. I gave one of my developers a highlighter and I said could you please just highlight what you used in the development uh, of this software based on the specification when he handed me back the document there was seven percent of the document was highlighted that meant 93 percent of that document was waste because it wasn't being used by the developer it's the same with any type of documentation what is really needed focus on minimalism but focus on what is value what is required for documentation does that answer that sufficiently answer the question Uh, because, uh, if, uh, yeah, uh, if you can, uh, because he is uh, saying no, uh, could you precise, precise the question again then because? Uh, so how do we do documentation uh, in a uh, complex? Okay, uh, um, because, I guess, yeah, just, uh, because has again uh, uh, written, his question is more on highly regulated documentation like validation plan, uh, especially in Pharma. Yes. Yeah. All right. In highly regulated, uh, with uh, how that is tied in, uh, typically what I have seen is that the documents uh, live in a SharePoint or repository and you stitch your deliveries to those documents as you deliver your code or your uh, uh, your, your, uh, your product uh, features and themes. So uh, imagine it this way. You have a document that lives in SharePoint and it isn't completely done, but as you're delivering your, uh, your working product, uh, you are updating that document as you go, and as you update that document, you reference
footprints, the stories or the bits of value that you're adding. And that living document then uh, is always up to date and has the most detailed um, uh, shared mental model of where you are. So ultimately when you deliver your final piece of value, uh, that document is uh, updated and you've done it in a manner that has the, uh, the least overhead. It, does that uh, address the, the question? I apologize if I, I, I'm not hitting it properly. Uh, Vikas wants to ask some questions directly. In that case, uh, Thomas, um, I think uh, he can connect to you offline uh, if you can sure. share your uh, contact details. Because we so have a few more questions to take. All right. Yeah. Uh, if you go to uh, www.tomfriend.com, that links you to my um, my LinkedIn page. I connect with everyone on LinkedIn and would welcome uh, discussions on Agile. Yeah. So the next question? Yeah, sure. Uh, next, uh, there's a question from Nitika. Uh, she's asking, can we use Agile in small projects, uh, like three to six months, where requirements are not fixed? Absolutely. I am working right now with a business incubator startup. Uh, that's where I see that Agile uh, at a team level is fluid and reactive. You're able to ensure that you're not getting bogged down in requirements and as, as long as you are engaging with your customer as quickly as possible, uh, I would encourage you to look at Lean Canvas and the business model canvas of how to engage, create a hypothesis and validate it and then go out and build it and it's all about the build measure learn so yes and yes next question you yeah, just uh, let me check and uh, read out the question okay yeah uh, next uh, there is a question uh, from Pavan sometimes uh, do you uh, following agile methodologies project completely get uh, sorry project complexity get increases then uh, how to work on that Yes, uh, when you look at uh, delivering uh, agile projects, uh, large agile projects, uh, typically they're always, uh, as you scale larger, there's going to be a degree of uh, framework or oversight in that. Uh, for example, uh, if you take a scaled agile framework, framework or um, scrum of scrums, uh, there needs to be a ability to see visibility at a higher level. So within the context of what you're doing, uh, look at uh, what level of coordination and complexity has to be seen and then how do you create your backlog uh, to uh, take into account what needs to be done uh, short term and long term. Basically it's your enablers, your predecessors, uh, and and that coordination can be done in a meaning, in refinement, or in something like in scaled agile framework, a uh, program increment where you bring all the teams together and have a discussion. But yes, as complexity um, and size gets large, there is a need for more, uh, more elegant, uh, detailed, prescriptive frameworks. Or that's been my experience. Okay, uh, yeah. we have uh, another question for, from uh, Sumit. Uh, can we use Agile to develop a product uh, which doesn't have a customer yet? Yes, you can. But what I would highly recommend you to do is have someone that is the proxy customer. Even if it's someone on the team, they're the customer. And you're asking questions of that person. Okay, well, would you like this? Do you, like, you need to have some type of feedback loop to the customer. Ideally, agility is all about delivering value to the customer. So having a customer, having a proxy, having someone that's going to be that voice is vitally important. When you're starting off and you're creating a minimum viable product, uh, having that input is vitally important so you can actually launch something. But yes, it can be done, but get the customer involved as soon as possible. Okay, uh, next question. 
what is the best method to estimate for user story as our team always fails to meet the deadline? I know. Yeah, that's, a, that's a great one. And I would uh, answer it with a question is how experienced is your team? You know, the best teams um, don't uh, estimate in hours. Uh, the, uh, the t or the teams that do worse uh, are the ones that estimate in hours. Or, but the teams also that do worse are the ones that don't estimate at all. There needs to be some understanding of how big work is so you don't take too much in. It's a work in progress, but it depends on the, uh, the maturity base of your team. An inexperienced team is going to have to spend more time estimating. Uh, in that case, it might be a Fibonacci. Uh, if you have an experienced team, uh, that has uh, stories or work items that are of similar size. You could use a t-shirt, small, medium, large. We could do three large and uh, two mediums in a sprint. Great. But it's in the context of the conversation of your team and what you're working on. But, so there's no fixed, fixed solution to that. Okay. Uh, coming to the next one. Here's a question, is uh, all the Agile projects always follow time and material based approach? When you look at time and materials uh, from a perspective of capacity, there are many dimensions to that. It depends on the size of the project, the delivery, the uh, scope. Uh, that comes down to a far more uh, complex uh, conversation. But ultimately, yes, it does come down to capacity because when you are, when are you really done in a software uh, uh, application? Well, you're really never done because you're always delivering. Uh, you really, in Agile, when you have enough, uh, good enough is when you're done. And how do you get to good enough quickest is time and the materials. Another question, perhaps. Yeah. Uh just let me check what is the next one. I can find. Yeah, we have another question. Uh, where do traditional roles uh, fit into Scrum? Example, business analyst, uh, solution architect, etc. Yeah, what you'll see in Scrum, especially in larger organizations, that uh, the traditional roles will blend. Uh, many times in large organizations, the PMO is still necessary from a perspective of, of regulatory oversight, right? compliance, governance, and financial accounting. It takes time for that to migrate. Many times what I've seen is business analysts become product owners, and those product owners then are integral parts of the broader organization. Many times a, a program or project managers will become scrum masters or business analysts because they understand the context of the delivery for their client. But it is at an individual level of where people will come to align as a product owner, a scrum master, or a team member. Uh, the other dimension to that was architect. Architecture at an enterprise level has a role, because at a large role, there needs to be someone coordinating the architectural um, activities on uh, uh, teams. Uh, the, in Agile and Scrum, though, the team uh, develops skill around implementing the broader architectural plan. All right, next question, please. Uh, next we have, the yeah, next we have, uh, what are your take on hybrid agile? In what context do you find it useful? Uh, would you please uh, say that one again? I can get yeah, the, uh, the question is, what are your take on hybrid agile? In what context do you find it useful? Oh, goodness. I think that hybrid agile, every agile is going to be hybrid in some way or form or another, uh, that uh, agility in its own is applying frameworks and practices in the context of your own solution. Uh, the, um, uh, the, the, what I would say with regards to Scrum is you must use the roles, the events, and the artifacts. Uh, if you skip, 
uh, items, productivity goes down. But beyond that, uh, bringing different hybrids together, uh, for example, Scrum Bond or Lean Bond or uh, any others, it's in the context of what you're doing. Uh, for example, a, a a uh, bottle manufacturing plant would be uh, using the same type of agility or lean methodology uh, as an aircraft manufacturing plant or uh, for that matter uh, if you're building a financial uh, uh, management system you're going to be using something different than uh, building a mobile mobile web app so it's the the blend of what you have in the context that you're um, that you're uh, delivering keeping in mind the values and the principles behind agility. Okay, uh, last uh, two questions and then uh, we will close the session because uh, like, there are a few more questions. Uh, we need to uh, tell them how they can ask their question. At the end, okay. uh, we will uh, share the details. All right, and yeah. please uh, feel free to uh, look me up on LinkedIn uh, or connect with me uh, there, and I'd be more than happy to uh, share, make introductions, and continue discussions. So next question is? Yeah, next question is, uh, can a person play multiple roles? Uh, for example, can a lead developer be a Scrum Master as well? Um, it's not ideal uh, because a lead developer uh, is more valuable developing uh, than chasing down impediments, coordinating backlog refinement uh, with the product owner, and doing all those things that facilitate uh, good development. Um, just from a cost perspective, uh, I would observe that a lead developer uh, price point is significantly higher than that of a, a Scrum Master, and that isn't necessarily the best uh, allocation of that uh, that individual. Next question. Yeah, the last one uh, we are taking. Uh, he's saying, I'd like to know if you have worked uh, with distributed agile teams. If yes, yes. Uh, uh, what kind of challenges you faced with the distributed agile teams? There are various. Uh, uh, various agile teams I've worked with. Uh, I've worked with uh, Middle East, uh, uh, Far East, uh, India, Africa, and uh, Europe. What I've found is obviously time differences can be very difficult. Uh, the manner in which you communicate uh, via document or email is uh, inefficient, uh, being able to bridge time gaps, use Skype, uh, use Sococo, use um, Zoom uh, to be able to see people uh, physically uh, and uh, develop a rapport, I believe is the best way uh, to, um, when you look at the actual execution of offshore, uh, if you break up uh, stories and backlog items so a team is stable within a organization you don't have a team you don't have team members on one team from multiple zones you distribute your team so you can have a team working on multiple backlog items in India uh, and in uh, Mexico uh, and every 24 hours you come together and you coordinate that work rather than having team members in each one of those areas that gets very confusing so it's how you break up your backlog and you encapsulate work around teams in time zones and locales and then bring that together and assemble it my hope is that uh, those best practices uh, will help Okay, so uh, there are a few more questions, Thomas, uh, which we are not able to uh, take right now due to the time boxing. Uh, friends, uh, yes. uh, you have uh, two options. Uh, you can tweet your question uh, using hashtag discuss agile. We will search the questions and uh, we'll forward to Thomas. Or uh, you can directly uh, connect to Thomas. He will be sharing his contact details uh, on the, for LinkedIn and you can directly ask to Thomas and yeah we will be sharing the recording of the session and uh, Thomas I hope uh, you will be sharing the presentation as well
Yep, you bet. And, uh, well, the, the beach music has just started here, and the sun is uh, rising over the uh, uh, the Gulf Coast. So I am going to go spend some time with my uh, my wife. And it was a pleasure talking with everyone. Please okay. feel free to look at the public again. Okay. So uh, it would be great if you please uh, share your uh, LinkedIn or any uh, contact point where people can ask questions to you directly because uh, there are a few questions which we are not able to take right now. Okay. Yeah, uh, you can uh, get me on uh, www.tomfriend.com. And uh, that links right to my um, my LinkedIn account. It's Thomas Friend. Okay. Okay, that's that's great. And uh, uh, thanks, uh, Thomas, for uh, sharing your insights. Uh, thanks for taking All time right. for us. And thanks, friends, for joining in. Uh, we will be coming up with our next webinar uh, very soon, announcing the next uh, dates. Till then, uh, stay connected. And thanks for joining in. Take care. Bye-bye.